Αυτό το session το βάλαμε από την αρχή, στοχεύοντας το να έχετε τη δυνατότητα να κάνετε ερωτήσεις στους keynote speakers με ένα ελεύθερο, σε ένα ελεύθερο διάλογο. Ακριβώς, για να, μην, να ξεφύγουμε λίγο από τα στεγανά του συνεδρίου και να υπάρχει μια ελεύθερη ανοιχτή συζήτηση, έχοντας τη δυνατότητα να εκφράσετε ό,τι πιστεύετε και ό,τι κερδίσατε από το συνέδριο αυτό, όσες δημιουργήθηκαν απορίες, οτιδήποτε άλλο, μια που τους έχουμε όλους εδώ μαζί και έχουμε τη δυνατότητα να συζητήσουμε μαζί τους. Οπότε, ο στόχος της συζήτησης αυτής είναι να μιλήσετε όσο περισσότερο δυνατόν εσείς, από τη δική σας πλευρά. Λόγω του ότι φιλοξενούμε την κυρία Μουζάβη, όλη η συζήτηση θα γίνει στα αγγλικά. Αν υπάρχει κάποιο πρόβλημα, ε, μπορεί επίσης να υπάρχει ερώτηση στα ελληνικά, να τη μεταφράσουμε και να υπάρχει ε, αντίστροφη επικοινωνία. Οπότε θα ξεκινήσει το session και έχω βάλει ένα είδος ε, δύσκολα στους keynote speakers. Δεν ξέρουν και οι ίδιοι γιατί είναι εδώ πάνω. Ε, οπότε, we start with this uh, slide. So first, it's very hard for you to see, so that's why I put it this way. And you have to answer in three minutes, each one, these three questions. So you have one minute to understand the questions. <laughs> Okay, so we start uh, uh, with Mr. Meliopoulos. Oh, uh, uh, we're supposed to speak in English, right? Yes, okay. in Well, to, to be honest, uh, um, I didn't expect to do that. Uh, I just uh, uh, was informed that I have to speak uh, what's going to happen in the next uh, 100 years. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, uh, my expertise is in the electric power systems, and I see that uh, we have a lot of issues to deal in the next, not only 100 years, but in the next 10, uh, 20 years. Uh, primarily, we have environmental issues. Uh, we have uh, 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 issues with the, uh, uh, with the economic development of the country. Uh, what electricity has to do with the economic development of the country? Well, uh, unemployment is one of the issues. Uh, by providing a, an um, inexpensive and easily to access electric energy, we generate new economic activities. Look, for example, what is happening with electric uh, cars or uh, pluggable electric cars and so on. Generate, uh, they are in the process of generating a new array of industries that uh, will increase the employment and so on. Uh, and at the same time, uh, in order to maintain this, the cost of uh, energy has to maintain low. We have a lot of solutions, a lot of experts can provide uh, answers very fast, but the bottom line is to, we need to provide answers that will maintain the cost of energy at low levels, and that's where the promise of the smart grid uh, and of course, smart grid means different things to a lot of different people, but the promise of the smart grid is to uh, develop a new, uh, a new paradigm of electric power delivery in such a way that the cost will maintain a low level, at the same time will enable the degradation of renewable and green power so that we'll have continuous electricity, a very high reliability. Um, it will uh, enable the development of new industries. I mentioned electric cars, but there is an array of other industries. Uh, uh, photovoltaics, uh, uh, wind, uh, uh, we're dealing with the also electri electrification of new industrial processes and so on, so that uh, employment, uh, economic activity will continue. So the challenge is to make all of this work together and maintain uh, the, at the end, I guess, uh, we need to maintain the quality of life because all of this that, that I talk to relate to the quality of life of everyday citizen. Excellent timing, thank you very much, uh, Professor Meliopoulos. Uh, we will go to my left, uh, to uh, Ms. Zara Marhawi. Well, 
I don't know about 50 years from now. I don't want to make any prediction for that either. But, but for the 10 next years, um, all I know based on the statistics in US, most of the statistics are available actually from US. Um, based on the prediction mark um, and prediction in the market, the job market, um, I can tell that the um, biomedical engineering is having the highest growth rate. And in fact, um, the majority of the jobs are going to be in that field. Although in some countries, like even Canada also, they are behind in that market, but the majority of the job market, the highest growth rate would be in biomedical engineering. And that is mainly because of the advances in computer technology and electronic. And that has caused many traditional fields to have overlaps and merge together. Um, for example, biomedical engineering has become in, uh, much, much wider, including nanotechnology, which is one of the main areas in electrical and computer engineering, um, information technology, IT groups, and um, for sure electronics um, that play a big role in medical devices, they all have em emerged together in order to provide the next generation of um, medical portable home care devices that are on the, um, on the growth. Um, to give you one example also from um, just absolute scientific, um, abstract science, many of our understanding of human brain and functionality, I, will, I predict that it will change significantly in the ne next 10 years. And it is due um, to the fact that now we have technology that we can understand and learn it much better. Many of our uh, knowledge comes from the um, primitive technology of 2D representation um, and experiments of pen and pencil experiments that is common in neuroscience. Nowadays, with the help of uh, virtual reality, with the help of uh, high resolution imaging, for sure um, the whole area of the neuroscience has been evolutionized. And it will continue in the next 10 years. As I said, I go back to my initial statement that the highest rate and the highest um, salary paid in engineering field overall, it is predicted to be in biomedical. And that field, uh, it even has overlap with the power, which is usually seen to be um, yeah. quite far from yeah. the biomedical, however, Except the field of civil engineering, I would say biomedical includes all other principles of engineering. Thank you very much, Professor Masawi. Uh, we will go uh, to my right, uh, uh, Dr. Zavaras, Dimitri Zavaras, director of IPTIL. Yes, uh, uh, I'm also not sure uh, about uh, how would they imagine uh, our world in uh, 20 years? I'm not sure uh, even uh, of what's going to happen in the next 10 years. Uh, I, I could say, first of all, that I hope that uh, uh, ICT, Information and Communication Technologies, will not change uh, completely the way people are uh, communicating. Uh, it seems that uh, Facebook and uh, Twitter and uh, social networking has changed, is changing the way uh, that we are, the ways that we are using to, to form uh, friends and uh, to organize parties and to, to, to live. And uh, th this is something that uh, uh, definitely uh, will uh, lead to, to a new dimension of uh, communication. And this is something that I cannot, I'm not sure that I. I have uh, a clue of uh, what's going to happen in the next 10-20 uh, years. Uh, speaking in general, I believe that uh, especially in Europe, uh, the next 10-20 uh, years will be uh, a field where uh, robotics will, uh, will uh, advance and uh, will be used in uh, many, many applications from agriculture to uh, home uh, uh, 
uh, related applications and uh, of course to industry, but this is something that has already happened. Uh, I believe that uh, in terms of uh, uh, health, uh, we should expect uh, uh, from the Human Brain Project, we should expect uh, new ideas for personalized uh, medicine. This is what is uh, missing. Uh, each one of us is, uh, has, uh, is an, an individual who has to be treated completely differently than the other. And this is uh, the goal of personalized medicine. Uh, using the results of uh, many uh, research uh, activities in, uh, in Europe, especially the human brain, I believe that uh, will be achieved in the next uh, 10, 20 years. And uh, coming more on to the uh, areas where uh, I'm uh, personally working, I believe that uh, uh, areas like uh, big data will evolve to huge data, to enormous uh, amounts of uh, data and the way we should uh, process them and uh, somehow visualize them and uh, present them uh, to people. And uh, I would like to finish saying that uh, for me, everything uh, relates to, to the interfaces with people. So there is a black box and uh, what we actually see from this black box is uh, the interface. And uh, you can see how, wh what, can, what a revolution can be made with just uh, a small uh, uh, advancement uh, in uh, uh, research, like the, the introduction of Kinect, for example, has changed completely the way that we are interfacing with uh, uh, many, even with uh, the TV. And uh, this is uh, something where I, I believe that in the next uh, 10, 20 years we'll have uh, significant uh, advancements. Thank you very much, Dr. Javaras. And we will again turn aside. Uh, Dr. Diomedes Michalopoulos will uh, talk probably about communications. Okay, so being the representative of the uh, telecommunication division, I would say that, okay, of course, I would talk about what I expect to be the future in the next maybe 10 to 15 years. So uh, I'm, I'll say, quite happy to talk about that because it's quite relevant to the uh, talk that I gave uh, two days ago. So uh, for us, the big challenge is pretty much related to uh, what the previous speakers talked about. For example, Dr. Javaras talked about the big data. So for us, the big challenge is how to make those schemes, how to make telecommunications to be able to accommodate this uh, transfer of big data that uh, the uh, future trends are uh, already showing us. So I would say that the, uh, uh, the main challenges for us for te te telecommunications in the next year would be twofold. First, in the uh, developing world, uh, it's, uh, we, we see a very, uh, very high trend towards uh, more devices being uh, getting more and more connected to the net. So uh, I believe it's uh, quite a big, uh, quite a job for the, uh, for the operators to be able to design the future schemes enable so that they be able to accommodate this uh, uh, big amount of user getting into the network. And second and most important is uh, the trend to uh, accommodate the data generated from the machine-to-machine uh, -machine communication, which is something that is being more and more getting into uh, our lives. And uh, there are some predictions saying that the, uh, the proportion of the uh, communications that are uh, machine-generated uh, as compared to those who are human-generated, they will be much higher. Predictions say even about 30 times to one. So uh, that will be a very uh, major issue. And uh, I think that people working towards that have to think mostly outside of the box. So 
uh, because these are the, the main uh, the main motives, the main uh, say the main uh, viewpoints, the, the main ideas that someone has to uh, has to to follow in order to be able to uh, to solve this problem to to uh, design the future telecommunication networks towards that direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mihalopoulos. And we will go to the youngest of them all, <laughs> uh, Dr. Dionysius Zindros. Hi. Uh, as the youngest in uh, this panel, I'd like to be a little more optimistic. Um, I'd like to start by uh, defining what the problem is for us engineers. And I think we should be looking much more broadly when we're talking about the problem for the next 100 years. Uh, the basic problem that I see with the world today is poverty and the problem of uh, education and healthcare that is not globally available. And I think as engineers, it is our job to fix this issue. Uh, my field is software, and I think software will uh, have the ability to tackle this problem uh, th through various ways. And uh, one huge example of this is uh, Wikipedia, in my opinion. Um, this website has revolutionized education globally. Uh, um, my colleague Diomedes mentioned previously that uh, there are targeting now developing countries in the field of telecommunications. As we make the internet more uh, ubiquitous uh, throughout the world, um, it will be able to help build educational and healthcare systems, um, which will mean that engineers will not only exist in Europe and uh, the Americas and Japan, but they will be available everywhere. And uh, they will be able to work on fixing the problem of um, educating others, building infrastructure for the people, improving the life uh, of, of everybody in the planet. Um, when it comes to software and how it's able to do that, I think we should be focusing on making the internet more available and building this infrastructure. Uh, my personal field of security and software, um, I think is contributing towards that. Um, maybe a lot of you have heard about cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin. Uh, these things uh, are turning the internet from uh, just a network to something that looks more like a country, a globalized country where uh, we have freedom of the press through WikiLeaks, we have uh, freedom of trade, we have freedom of information, and uh, free education through websites like Wikipedia, Coursera, uh, Open Coursera by MIT and Stanford. Uh, and uh, potentially also uh, more uh, better healthcare and more available healthcare through the internet. Um, Google is also doing a project called Google Loon, which will make the internet more available to people. Uh, I think this is this is something very important uh, that we can do as software engineers to spread this uh, and and improve the world. This, to me, this is the important issue that we should be focusing on. Um, now, when it comes to uh, things like cryptocurrencies and um, security, uh, there, there are a lot of attempts to um, turn the internet into a country. Like, um, there's a new project called Ethereum. Uh, this, we hope, will uh, improve the ideas on decentralized voting, uh, decentralized governance, uh, decentralized entrepreneurship. Uh, we think these will be will, will be able to improve the world on a massive scale. So uh, this is where I see the world improving in terms of software. Thank you very much. It was obvious the difference between the observation of the three questions through, uh, depend on the age. You see, <laughs> the Onesis answered the first and the, or most of them, and the others focus on the last one. So it's your turn now to ask the questions to the experts. So the floor is yours. Ο πρώτος που ακάνει ερώτηση θα πάρει 10 στο μάθημα. 
Αυτό ε, όποιο θέλει. It's totally free discussion, so you can say what you're thinking. I think that all your statements were quite conservative. I'd like you to close your eyes and think in every in one day in the street after 100 of years from now. And believe me, I have the feeling that no one of here are going to blame you after 100 of years if you are not quite sure of if what you think that is going to happen actually <laughs> will not happen after 100 of years. Uh, <laughs> it was a statement. So, we're going to increase the offer to two lessons. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Pedio <laughs> ένα δύο. You make very hard bargain. We put the signal processing and uh, circuits <laughs> gradually, yes? Come on, come on, come on. No, we have to put a <laughs> so, the first is the tough, I know. But we already made the, the effort here, and uh, it's your turn now. I already said, yes. So I'll try to take this big step. <laughs> uh, there was a lot of mention about biomedical engineering. So I was uh, wondering especially about this field. What might come in uh, the near and not so near future? Let's say in the next uh, 30 years, for example. In uh, this field, in uh, what ways exactly electrical engineers might uh, help humanity as a whole advance? So, uh, just to set the stage for this kind of discussion, I wonder if, for example, it might be uh, technically feasible and not science fiction to talk about uh, processing uh, human, uh, not processing, uh, depicting human thoughts and uh, characterizing them through machines that we already know, like uh, computers. For example, to be able to, let's say, plug in a mind to a computer. Well, how difficult would, you, how long do you think it would take and would it be reasonable to believe that uh, we might be able to actually do such kind of things? I think Dr. Munzavi will answer. Well, you're asking if it is when it would be possible to read the minds, right? In a way, yes. Um, maybe it is even possible right now. <laughs> well, not too few. Uh, it, this issue has ethical issues, first of all, you can imagine. And it would be a horrible world if people would be able to read each other's mind immediately. And um, we should be thankful that we can't. Some people believe that they have psychic power and can do it without any technology. Uh, nevertheless, what you're s saying, it is in a way, even right now, is feasible by, and that's how that people do brain-computer interfacing. I'm sure that you are familiar with that. There are games that um, one can play it by just focusing and by mind. And there are studies who um, decode the dreams. This study in particular is being run in Berkeley University and um, they ask their subjects to um, sleep under fMRI machine 
and they try to decode the, um, the thoughts, basically decode the dream. Um, there has been a studies that shows um, they have trained the programs that can detect how the person is thinking, um, but it has been limited to um, image processing and th thinking of images, basically. So these research, at least the pilot ones, has been done. It shows that we are capable um, of coming up with technology that can read mind. Is it a useful tool or not? That's subject to debate. I personally think no. Um, we need a little bit of uh, ambiguity and mystery in order to enjoy the life. Um, if everything is crystal clear, there is not much to discover. Mm, but in terms of useful application, it can have a lot of useful application for handicapped people, for people who don't have arms, who don't have legs, and you can control a device with minds. That was actually the motivation be, uh, behind this technology even to reach the point that it is right now. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Well, I'll take this question and turn it a little bit around uh, in the sense that um, uh, there is a lot of uh, work going on right now to study uh, the brain and uh, start developing uh, supercomputers based on the way our brain works. Uh, I already hit the, uh, pretty much the engineering list on supercomputers. Uh, we are on the thousand teraflops and so on. And then the next step is to have, to have new technology by which we can do uh, supercomputing. And uh, as a matter of fact, to process the enormous amount of information of uh, data we have um, to get out of the information. The same way our brain works, uh, our body uh, collects an enormous amount of information from all parts of the body that processes through the brain. So it's not gonna be very far in the future where we're gonna have supercomputers working the way the, uh, the human brain works. Uh, and uh, that's a simpler engineering problem uh, than the one that I mentioned already. So this was a question to read the professor's mind to know the exams before the exams, yes, the themes. <laughs> so any other question? Yes, please. Hello. Uh, my name is Las Kuchos from uh, NTUA. And uh, I would like to ask about um, the vision that uh, my colleague Zindros uh, talked about, the internet of things or everything, actually. And uh, the future, which we will software engineers try to get there, uh, it will be, in my opinion, cloud-based, like it is going right now. The major question that is in my mind, and probably many, many of our colleagues here, is the security of this uh, software or, or everything that is on the cloud. If we think, if you think actually, that this is uh, something that can be done, is the first uh, part of my question. And the second one is when we will fail, <laughs> in my opinion, to secure something, all of this, the Internet of Things, uh, what will happen? Thanks for the question, that's very interesting. Uh, so you mentioned that we are moving towards a cloud-based internet, which is true, uh, and it's very hard to secure. Uh, we've, we've seen numerous examples of companies being hacked. Uh, we've, during the last few years, we've seen NSA eavesdropping on people's uh, communication channels. Uh, these are very serious problems. Uh, I think we should all be concerned about these, and this includes our privacy. Um, I think uh, in the long run, we are actually going to move towards decentralized systems, uh, not, not generally cloud-based where the cloud means the server 
of some company or the network of some particular company. Uh, we have seen numerous examples of this right now. Uh, Bitcoin is one of them. Uh, it's a decentralized currency, a way to make payments that is not controlled by anyone. Uh, Diaspora is a social network which is um, distributed, similar to Facebook. Twister is an alternative to Twitter, which is decentralized. Uh, all of these are, uh, they seem like uh, cloud-based systems, but they are not controlled by a particular company. And their security and privacy protections are not just uh, legalese, they're not just in the terms of service of these companies, but they are insured by the software itself. Uh, so it's impossible for a single company or any individual or any government to uh, manipulate the software, eavesdrop, etc. Uh, because we have cryptographic insurances that this will not happen. And we have some sort of mathematical proofs that this is going there. I don't know if we will be able to decentralize everything. Of course, there is a lot of companies that try not, not to allow that. Uh, there's a lot of governments that would not like that at all. Uh, however, I think this improves the world tremendously if we can do that because we can have freedom of the press, as I mentioned, freedom of trade through cryptocurrencies, um, freedom of speech through anonymizing networks. Uh, so I think in the long run we will move there eventually and I think we will be able to secure these systems um, as they will be in the control of the people. Does that answer the question? Uh, thank you for the answer. Uh, that was actually a bit of uh, the first part of my question. The second one is, if we move towards uh, this uh, leap, of uh, this technological leap, and uh, we base the entire globe under this umbrella of uh, cloud, internet, or whatever it will be called later, uh, if someone makes a breakthrough which can destroy this whole uh, building that we have created, what, what is there next to do? What is the next move? Like, uh, take electricity, for example. If now someone, let's say, in quotes, hacks the electricity, what will happen? Well, we'll have well, to rebuild the system. Watch revolution, huh? What? You Sorry. obviously are a fan of uh, revolution. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Well, uh, in, in the field of security, we have a term called security in depth, which means that if one measure in security breaks, we have additional measures to guard against this possibility. So this is one answer. Uh, of course, when there are security issues, there are implications. Hopefully, by eliminating single points of failure, we will be able to eliminate at least a little bit the security implications of such uh, problems. Um, hopefully we will not have any system on which everybody uh, is dependent on. So by building a decentralized infrastructure, if one node is hacked or fails, the rest will continue to um, support the infrastructure. So this is something that we aim for. If the whole infrastructure is destroyed through a security problem, we will have to rebuild it, of course. There is nothing else to do. Could I add uh, to this uh, discussion? If we can uh, imagine uh, a future, a not so distant future of uh, uh, an Internet of Things where every device uh, will have uh, its own uh, ability to uh, connect uh, to the Internet and uh, the other devices. If we can uh, envision a, a future where the collective uh, machine intelligence will surpass the collective human intelligence. Of course, we have to uh, uh, question uh, whether uh, this uh, uh, future is going to have machines overpowering hum humans, overtaking uh, humans. Uh, it's, it's not too far out uh, because uh, the intelligence of the machines is growing much faster than uh, the uh, uh, intelligence of, uh, of humans. Uh, uh, you, uh, or you will have to uh, face this uh, reality, either confront it or, or build it. 
uh, in the next um, three or uh, three decades or so. Uh, some people uh, put this uh, event uh, in uh, the year of 2045 or, or, or so. So uh, you will all be alive then, and you will uh, have to decide which uh, side to take, the machine or, or, or the human. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, actually, for uh, bringing this uh, issue here, because I think it's quite important, the issue of security. So here I would like just to add a few things very quickly. Well, uh, the first one is that uh, I believe security is very important, but as we have seen, uh, as uh, technology has progressed, has progressed throughout the uh, latest years, so uh, we see that security is always one step behind. You know, is uh, first we see the progress, and then we see the uh, the mechanisms and all the effort to to uh, that is related with security. So. Uh, I don't believe that uh, that's a sufficient reason for uh, not considering uh, further progress in technology uh, in that sense. So, and that's what has happened already. I believe that will be happening in the next years. The second thing is that uh, I also think it's very dangerous if we uh, just let uh, those uh, schemes that are simply operated by machines to be to take full control, you know. So, for example, I was talking about my talk about the uh, uh, automated uh, traffic control system. So, just imagine if someone is able to hack the system and be able to control all those uh, traffic lights in the city, which are operated, you know, automatically through some uh, centralized unit or whatever. So, it will be uh, something like a science fiction that we are not very able to comprehend now, but it will be quite dangerous. So. I think it's uh, something that uh, we should take into account, at least not we, but mostly the authorities should uh, have uh, this, uh, you know, should put much attention to that. Thanks. Who's the person here? Um, because uh, the conversation tackled a very crucial issue, I think. Uh, I was keeping this for the end, but uh, uh, Pericles uh, actually opened the discussion. Uh, maybe I'm a little bit old-fashioned, but uh, as an engineer, I was thinking of engineering to be something that uh, is going to help humanity and human, humans generally to make their life uh, easier, more effective. And I'm afraid that if we put our vision for the next 50 or 100 years to a machine-controlled society, uh, where is the human factor in this, uh, in this uh, vision? Uh, and uh, I, it makes me really scared to, to listen to such things where the main issue is the security or what's going is the security is broken. Because I, I feel that uh, living in a, a, a cyber environment like that that uh, uh, our good friend Dionysus described uh, scares me a little because where comes the human relations, the real human relations, not the cyber relations that everyone has through social networks and uh, talks uh, in tweets or in uh, SMS or in whatever. We are still feeling that we are losing this part of our everyday life. Are we going to lose it even more? Are we going to be more isolated? Are we going to be a community that could be much more easily manipulated by some means, uh, for some people that they have the means of interfering with this technology? These are very crucial issues, to me at least. And I hope that they will be the same for you as young future engineers. Because you will have to handle all these issues in the future by yourself. And you know, it is much more than a couple of more papers or a couple of more patents or even a Nobel Prize. What you have as a vision on what you are doing in your research or in your technology, actually. And I would like to have some comments on this from the panel. I may say a few words. Uh, uh, I think that uh, 
as we all uh, explained, it's very difficult to predict the future. And uh, you, you, we may learn from the past. We have seen uh, what type of uh, resolution uh, has brought in uh, everyday uh, life from uh, television. And uh, what uh, you described uh, before, I may argue that uh, television is actually doing exactly this to, to us. It is uh, actually restricting the amount of information that we are getting from what's actually happening uh, everywhere. And this is something that uh, is also happening also through the internet. It may, internet is uh, more well accepted by the community uh, ma mainly because it gives this uh, freedom. You can see also different uh, opinions and you can uh, access uh, the real uh, facts. Uh, so, so what I, I actually believe is that uh, whatever the technology is capable of doing in the, within the next years, the people will have to adapt. The way you, you see that uh, uh, human relations are adapting now to this new Facebook, Twitter, uh, uh, revolution, I would say, uh, and uh, cloud computing and uh, Internet of Things, I see them as technologies, but uh, they are not the, for me, the revolution was uh, television and uh, the Internet. So there should be an, another type of resolution, revolution within the next years, and uh, I do believe that people will adapt, will find uh, their way to use uh, technology. And uh, whether the machines or uh, humans uh, will uh, actually uh, take the decisions uh, within the future is something that is not uh, going to happen within one day. And this gives a lot of time to people to adapt their lives to this new reality. Uh, this, uh a very good ethical question, and uh, uh, in engineering, uh, we believe, uh, we all, you're going to be uh, all uh, here, engineers and so on, uh, engineering should be improving continuously the quality of life. Uh, this means when we're talking about development of machines, uh, we really strive to replace menial works that uh, a human is doing with machines. We don't try, engineers should not try to mimic the mind uh, the, uh, or the, to take the human factor out of uh, this. Uh, we've seen this, is, uh, this happening. For example, robots working on nuclear plants, uh, uh, other, uh, uh, various tasks being uh, 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 roboticized and so on. Uh, but eventually, uh, we, we hope that the human being is going to be always in the loop and simply is going to have a better, um, a better life. There is uh, many universities in the U.S. Uh, they adapt in um, uh, uh, courses on ethics in engineering that goes beyond, uh, uh, that try to address these issues. Now, also, uh, I would like to uh, point out that in all of these matters, I think studying history uh, gives us a very good guidance of how we should be thinking. Um, so, for example, if you think about the people that developed the atomic bomb and so on, uh, Feinstein, uh, uh, um, Einstein, and so on, and if you read their stories after the, these developments, they, they pose these problems, in, uh, in, uh, they raise their questions themselves, uh, whether they developed a master and so on, uh, and at the end, uh, if we look at what happened in the last uh, 50 years and so on, Humanity is trying to control uh, that development uh, and use it only for the better of uh, humanity and uh, try to, uh, uh, to limit the, uh, the other uses. But of course, the world is not, uh, uh, it has a lot of bad people and uh, we don't know what is going to happen, but we have to have faith in the human mind uh, that uh, these issues will be resolved. And again, as engineers, I think the ethical thing to do is to develop uh, to re uh, the machines we built, they should replace the menial uh, tasks uh, for, the, for improving the quality of life of humans. Yes. Question there? There? 
Α ρωτήσουν κάποιοι άλλοι και μετά. Γιατί θα νομίζουν ότι σε πληρώσαμε σήμερα. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Polychronos Bakomitros uh, from the University of Patras, and uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one uh, is, uh, what do you think of uh, open and free software and hardware, and how it could uh, improve uh, both science and engineering and uh, our lives? The second one after. Uh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, I think in the past, uh, engineers and scientists used to work more in isolation or in smaller teams across the world. Uh, we, we are moving towards a more uh, collaborative environment in science now. Uh, there's no way to uh, work on your own anymore. Uh, we, we, have, we have publications on the internet that are accessible to everybody. Um, there is a known problem in the publication uh, of papers. Uh, many of you know it. Uh, we ha uh, people have to pay in order to be able to view papers or read papers. Uh, this is an important problem right now because journals are often owned by private companies. And uh, scientists are paid by, uh, government and by governments and by the people to do research um, so I think this is an important question for science and engineering. Uh, I think we will be moving towards a more open world in the science, uh, in the sciences, and in engineering. Uh, the most important thing that I see in this, in terms of science, is moving towards a more open um, paper publication process in which papers are accessible to everybody for free. Uh, I think this will tremendously improve the way people can do research and uh, write software and do science. Uh, so I do, of course, support open source and free software and open hardware. I think this is really uh, the way to go. Uh, I think this makes science and engineering accessible outside of universities to people that don't have the means to access uh, traditional papers through journals and conferences, even in, sometimes in developing countries. Uh, so it's very important that we focus on developing open source software, publishing our research under uh, open licenses, and uh, of course working on open hardware as well. So I, I hope you agree. Yes. And, and the second question? Uh, the, sec uh, the second question. Uh, well, uh, what, uh, what is your opinion about uh, the development of academical and educational process in uh, engineering? What would you like to change? Well, in engineering, I think what we are missing is uh, the training of our engineering student to become entrepreneur, to start um, developing their own R&D startup businesses. I think that is missing mm. from engineering uh, teaching in general, because um, one way to grow the industry is also through the small businesses, small companies. And um, as an engineering, I'm myself an engineer, but I learned a lot about the industry through um, a pattern that we had. And then I realized that I didn't know anything about marketing and what, should, uh, what the steps are required from a uh, lab prototype until it becomes a marketable prototype. In fact, initially I was thinking that 
the whole novelty, the whole creativity, the whole value is to develop a lab prototype. And during the process, I humbled by learning that not really, that's not the whole novelty and it is a huge mm. process in between. And I think our engineering education ac across the board missing that. And uh, we should go toward establishing it. Also, um, I have one comment regarding your first question. That's I think no it problem. is great that people share their software, their hardware, and, um, and it has helped significantly to the development of new technologies. Um, as an example, Arduino boards, Arduino um, programs, which is hardware software programs, are being done by uh, sharing it, in fact. All of it is free. And people who develop the program just leave it in the public domain. Nobody can uh, use it inside a um, patent a technology because it has been already secured for the public. That's one typical example. Well, uh, in addition to these comments, um, I would like to point out that uh, there is a big change in uh, engineering education um, uh, and a lot of these things are driven by, uh, uh, by the United States, um, where certain universities, for example, Stanford started the issue of, uh, since we have all this communication media now, why we don't access uh, more, uh, more engineering students and spread the word and so on, make, make more engineers out of the, uh, of the uh, uh, big population and so on. Uh, and um, uh, so we see now uh, engineering education delivered through communication media. Uh, the term MOOC is uh, uh, being used and so on. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I'm an old timer and I would like the, to make the following observation. Uh, I finished uh, the Metsovio about uh, 42 years ago, something like this. And most of the education then, it was on basic principles. Now, if we look at the curriculum of the electrical engineering, the material we cover has uh, uh, increased by 100-fold. Okay. Uh, of course, we have better ways of delivering this material, a lot more, uh, uh, a lot more, a lot more um, uh, visualizations and uh, uh, compressed information that uh, is delivered to uh, future engineers and so on. Uh, but at the same time, there are a lot of studies that indicate that people that they are exposed simply to a lot of visualizations and uh, material and so on, they do not retain as much information as uh, people that are exposed to basic, basic principles and so on, and homework the traditional way. So uh, study after study indicates this. Now, at the same time, we see the following thing. All the discoveries, and we should expect in the next uh, few decades, the discovery is going to come at the, what we call the crossroads, where various disciplines, various areas meet together. Okay? Uh, electric ener energy will be uh, benefited from nanotechnology and so on. So when you start marrying the various disciplines, that's where you get into new discoveries and so on. And that's why they say it's very difficult to predict the future, especially when you're talking about the future. Okay. Uh, so we really don't know where it's going to uh, go there, but I think I would like to stress the point that uh, we need to concentrate in um, uh, fundamentals and uh, uh, prepare engineers that have knowledge not only in one area, but uh, a lot of other areas. Entrepreneurship <laughs> is uh, a very good one that is mentioned uh, before. Uh, and then let the new engineers do the discoveries and so on. Uh, so there is a lot of things to happen in the engineering education in the future. There are a lot of trends going different directions. And I don't know where it's going to go, but eventually, I think uh, the pendulum is going to return back to the basic principles. Yeah. Another question here? Yes. There. And then. Over there. Raise your hand. Yes, it's there first, and then over there. Okay. It's two. 
Καλησπέρα. Ονομάζομαι Αθανάσιος Μόσχος και σπουδάζω στο τμήμα ηλεκτρολόγων μηχανικών ah, in English. I would like to make my question in Greek and if you can translate it, okay? And I'm sorry. Okay. Λοιπόν, ε, η ερώτησή μου είναι αν η ψηφιοποίηση της παιδείας και της εκπαίδευσης που λαμβάνουν οι νέες γενιές ανθρώπων που μεγαλώνουν αυτή τη στιγμή αποτελεί πρόβλημα ή όχι. Και θα ήθελα να αναφέρω δύο, πιστεύω, αρκετά χαρακτηριστικά παραδείγματα. Ε? Ναι, οκ. Okay. Uh, the first part of this question is whether the, the digitalization, the digitalization of uh, education in engineering is, um, is a step forward or a step backwards. And uh, the second part of the question will be... Θα αναφέρω τώρα τα δύο παραδείγματα. Ε, σε ένα ιδιωτικό νηπιαγωγείο στην Αθήνα ε, υπάρχουν διαδραστικοί μονοπίνακες. Δεν υπάρχει μαύρο πίνακα, ο κλασικό που είχαμε εμεί όταν ήμασταν πιο μικροί. Και δεν υπάρχουν καθόλου βιβλία. Τα παιδάκια από μικρά έχουν iPad. iPad και είναι εξηγημένα με αυτά. Σε έναν πλήρω δηλαδή αναλογικό κόσμο υπάρχει μόνο χρήση ψηφιακή τεχνολογία για την παιδεία του και για την εκπαίδευσή του. Ε, ένα παιδάκι από αυτά αναγκάστηκε για χύψη λόγου να φύγει από το ιδιωτικό νηπιαγωγείο και να πάει στο δημόσιο. Ε, οι μετρήσει που κάνανε στο ιδιωτικό νηπιαγωγείο στο διαδραστικό πίνακα γινόταν με χάρακα που εμφανίζονταν πάνω στον πίνακα. Όταν λοιπόν ο δάσκαλο στο δημόσιο σχολείο σήκωσε το παιδάκι στον πίνακα για να κάνει κάποια μέτρηση με ένα χάρακα, το παιδάκι προσπάθησε να εμφανίσει αυτό το χάρακα στο... στο πίνακα, το μαύρο πίνακα. Δεν μπορούσε, έπαθε κρίση πανικού και το στείλανε στο νοσοκομείο. Το ένα είναι αυτό. Το δεύτερο είναι ότι. Okay. Um, the first uh, example uh, my colleague here presented was that there's a private uh, elementary school, a preschool actually, uh, in Athens, where everything is uh, by default uh, in a digital version. Uh, this uh, this means uh, kids have iPads instead of books and use a digital uh, blackboard instead of a regular one. And there was an incident where uh, one child was forced to leave this, this private preschool and uh, go to a, to a public uh, normal school. And he was not uh, familiar with the ways that most people work. So when the, when the professor asked him to do a simple task on the, on the blackboard, he He panicked, and as a result, he he was uh, transferred to a hospital. That was the first example. Το δεύτερο παράδειγμα είναι πάλι από αυτό το ίδιο ιδιωτικό νηπιαγωγείο, με όλη τη διαδικασία αυτή που είναι ψηφιωμένη όλη η παιδεία που λαμβάνουν τα παιδιά και ο τρόπος που λαμβάνουν αυτή η παιδεία. Πάλι ένα παιδάκι αναγκάστηκε να φύγει και να πάει σε δημόσιο. Και όταν ο καθηγητής το σήκωσε στον πίνακα για να γράψει με κοιμολία, το παιδάκι πήρε την κοιμωλία και μόλις είδε ότι μου τζουρώθηκαν τα χέρια του, πέταξε την κοιμωλία, άρεσε να φωνάζει και να βάζει τα κλάματα. The second example uh, is from the same uh, private preschool and about another kid who left this situation where everything was digitalized and had to go to a public school. And the incident uh, was that when the professor asked uh, the, the child to to pick up a piece of chalk and do something on the, on the board, he saw that his hands were getting dirty from the, from the chalk, and he panicked and he uh, broke to tears, and it was a very distressful experience for him. The paradigms are really true, because they have said that the girl was a teacher. I don't want to say anything about it, but I want to say και η ερώτηση είναι αυτή. Σε ένα κόσμο ο οποίο είναι πλήρω αναλογικό και ο οποίο έχει αρχίσει και ψηφοποιείται, αν κάτι καταρρεύσει και ενώ έχει συνηθίσει με μια συγκεκριμένη διαδικασία να κάνει κάτι ψηφιακά και αναγκαστεί να την κάνει αναλογικά, πώ θα ανταπεξέλθει. Από τη στιγμή που αυτό σε πανικοβάλλει και σπά ουσιαστικά. Αυτό είναι το θέμα. Ή αν θα μπορέσει να ανταπεξέλθει. Και ουσιαστικά είναι προσθετικό σε αυτό που ρώτησε ο φίλο μου Βλάση εδώ πέρα, που δεν ήταν τόσο το θέμα τη ασφάλεια, τη security. Αλλά ότι αν κάτι έχει συνηθίσει και το κάνει ψηφιακά. Αν θα μπο... και μαθαίνει να το κάνει μόνο ψηφιακά, αν θα μπορέσει όταν δεν βγαίνει αυτό το πράγμα να ανταποκριθεί στον αναλογικό σου κόσμο. Αυτό. Και ευχαριστώ και συγγνώμη για την καλεσμένη μα. 
So to conclude, the question, the real question is, uh, is, it, is, it, uh, is it good, is it effective for a world that's completely in an analog state and which is uh, now starting to get digitalized to be, to be forced into an educational system where everything is digitalized and is, is not as, um, as normal as a regular... Uh, the regular educational system. So this is a question, and please. So this is a difficult question. So let's start. I don't think it's a, it's a question, it's more of a statement. Uh, I don't think we should uh, consider uh, uh, a digital classroom as uh, a step backwards, okay? Uh, we will uh, continue to uh, uh, develop new ways to teach, uh, new ways to uh, uh, spread uh, knowledge and uh, help uh, children, uh, people everywhere uh, to gain uh, access to this uh, knowledge. Uh, today we have uh, more digital classes than anybody, uh, than any time uh, before in our, in our history. Uh, today we use uh, digital technology uh, more than any uh, time uh, uh, in the past. And today we have more people educated than any time in the, in the history of, of humankind. As uh, uh, we move towards uh, uh, more technology in the classroom, we will have more people uh, educated as a result. Uh, there will always be examples like uh, those you, uh, you described, because there will always be instances uh, like that to remind us that we have to do better, that we have to find ways to, uh, uh, to overcome these uh, problems, to find ways to bring everybody in line or give everybody equal access to, uh, to education and uh, an opportunity. But uh, I wouldn't call uh, the digitalization of, uh, of education as a step backwards, by no means. Okay, and the other question there? Γεια σα. Αφού σα ευχαριστήσω θερμά, Παπαδάκη Αντώνη Ρωμάζομαι. Είμαι ιδιώτη επενδυτή. Θα ήθελα, αφού εκφράσω το θαυμασμό μου στη νέα γενιά και αυτά που μα παρουσιάσανε, να θέσω μια προβληματική, η οποία έχει μια λιγάκι πλοκή. Τα αγγλικά μου, συγγνώμη, που δεν μπορούν να ανταποκριθούν σε αυτό. Αυτό που θέλω να ρωτήσω είναι πώ η ενέργεια τη νέα γενιά και οι εκπληκτικέ ιδέε θα μπορέσουν να βρουν μια εφαρμογή σε έναν κόσμο ο οποίο, α πούμε, τις, κατά κάποιο τρόπο ε, τι ε, ε, θάβει. Δηλαδή δεν τι προωθεί, δεν βρίσκει την ανταπόκριση που θα μπορούσαν. Θεωρώ δεδομένο μέσα από μια διαπιστωμένη έλλειψη υποδομών ότι σε αυτό το επίπεδο η επιστημονική κοινότητα και οι νέοι άνθρωποι με τις ε, ε, τεχνικές τους γνώσεις, θα μπορούσαν να προσφέρουν τα μέγιστα για έναν κόσμο ασφάλειας, αξιοκρατίας, που θα ε, μπορέσει, ας πούμε, να αναμορφώσει μια οικονομία που στην ουσία τρώει το, την κοινωνία. Είναι, δε, δεν ξέρω κατά πόσο είναι εύκολο να το μεταφράσει ο φίλος εδώ πέρα, αλλά η προβληματική που θέτω είναι αυτή, ότι από τη μια χαίρομαι απεριόριστα για, την, για τις νέε ιδέε και για την αγώνα που κάνουν και για το επίπεδο το μορφωτικό που έχει η νέα γενιά, το υψηλότατο, από την άλλη θλίβομαι γιατί διαπιστώνω ότι στην ουσία είναι, όπως είπε ένας πολύ σωστά, είναι σε ένα ωκεανό κόκκινο, σε αρέτη ωκεάν, και όχι σε ένα μπλε ωκεανό, το ώστε να βρουν μια ανταπόκριση και να τους εξασφαλίσει μια αξιοπρεπή ζωή όπως δικαιούνται. Η ερώτηση που αυτή we are in a deep crisis and whether all the young, the young generation and it, its ideas and its vision are, are oppressed due to the lack of, of opportunities, 
um, how can this generation uh, invert the situation and use the great technological advancements to, to help uh, improve the infrastructure of, the, of a country and of a whole economical system? Uh, καταρχήν, αυτό... Δεν έκλεισε. Δεν έκλεισε. Δεν έκλεισε. I was uh, misled by the uh, question in, in Greek, I guess. Um, uh, basically, I see a lot of this is happening already. We've seen presentations from startup companies uh, here in Greece and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, there is the potential in Greece to start new things. We, we have the brain power to do great things. Uh, I remind you the Antikythera mechanism. Uh, if we, two millennia ago we can do something like this, we can do a lot better uh, today. Now, things uh, go slow, however, in this, in, uh, in this process. Uh, somebody has to have a basic idea uh, and then work hard, tagatha kopis ktode, and develop uh, the technology. Now, um, today we live in a digital world. That is, um, anything engineering is basically digital, from communications to energy to, uh, 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 to medicine and so on. It's everything digital. And this means that a lot of new discoveries can be done and can be developed with very little investment. Um, people smart people can start something in their basement, uh, develop something that uh, will be useful to society, and then that's all you need. The rest of it is going to take its own course. Uh, so I was very pleased to see these startups, and uh, uh, one way to, for people that have uh, uh, the inclination to follow this uh, route, uh, they can study history. A lot of uh, new developments that we live in and we take advantage today uh, uh, came from uh, developments in the basement of someone that uh, eventually uh, uh, went uh, into a product and uh, became useful to everybody. And the last question there. Uh, we have another one. Yes, the last question there, perhaps. Ah, okay. We continue a little bit. Okay. I thought we were tired, but. It seems that you have interest in. Good evening. Uh, uh, my name is Harry Mandelakis, and I would like to direct my question to Mr. Uh, Dionysis Sidros. And uh, regarding uh, cryptocurrencies, I would like to see the conversation toward there. We, uh, the first part is, which do you think are the imminent applications of uh, like cryptocurrencies like bitcoins or any other altcoins in the Greek sector specifically? And also, the second part is, what do you think that uh, Greek engineers could do uh, to help uh, to, uh, jobs around this uh, technology? Uh, thank you for mentioning cryptocurrencies. This is actually my field of research at my university now, so I'm very happy to talk about it. Uh, I think in terms of, uh, of cryptocurrencies, the most imminent application that you asked about is in micropayments in online services. Um, I think uh, a lot of Greek people are not so familiar with uh, paying on the internet. And I think cryptocurrencies are uh, offering us a chance to make this much easier for people if we are able to improve the user interfaces and the way that people are able to acquire these. Uh, so once we do this, we will be able to let people spend money on apps, on websites, on video games, small amounts. Uh, I think this was your question in regards to how it applies in the business sector. Um, and, and uh, the second question was, can you repeat it, please? Uh, what part could uh, Greek uh, electrical engineers, uh, could they take in this process? 
Right. Uh, so as I mentioned in the opening question, uh, I think the internet is evolving into a, a globalized country, and I don't think the question comes to is particular to Greek engineers. If there's any research to be done about cryptocurrencies, this can be done by anybody, including Greek engineers. And so we, we live in a, in a society that is ubiquitous, that involves a ubiquitous internet, and, and cryptocurrencies are a part of that. So any research that is open in cryptocurrencies is also available to everybody here. Uh, I think that cryptocurrencies will have a very important uh, impact in the long run towards the world, to the world, not only in terms of business, but more importantly, in terms of um, ethics, in terms of uh, trade, in terms of freedom, in terms of education, healthcare, etc. Uh, so I, th I, I would encourage people to, to do research on that. Uh, there are, uh, there's a tremendous amount of open uh, research to be done. Um, there are many projects that are uh, available for dissertations and PhDs on, on the subject. Uh, I mentioned previously Ethereum, which is a, a new cryptocurrency which is much broader than just a currency. It's uh, digital contracts, decentralized contracts. There's a lot of research to be done there. Um, my own research is also related to this uh, on, on building an anonymous uh, decentralized marketplace. Uh, this is a huge field. Uh, I'm just building a very small part of it. Uh, if if people are interested, they can continue contributing. And uh, I've I, I'm aware of a lot of universities also doing research in similar fields. Harvard and Stanford are doing similar research. So uh, there's uh, a lot of topics. So if you are interested in doing research on that, anybody here, uh, feel free to talk to me. We can. I can, I can suggest subjects to you, but just going online and reading the various papers that are available, you can already see so many different paths uh, that this can take. Uh, Namecoin is another uh, new cryptocurrency with a different application. So I would say, uh, yeah, definitely definitely uh, look more into it. I think anybody can, can do research in this field, including Greek engineers. Thank you very much. Καλησπέρα. Ε, θα προτιμούσα να μιλήσω στα ελληνικά και να τοποθετήσετε εσεί στα αγγλικά αργότερα. Ε, ουσιαστικά θα ήθελα να ρωτήσω, αφού πρώτα από την τάξη, εσεί έχετε διακριθεί ήδη σε αυτό το χώρο του προγραμματισμού και σα συγχαίρουμε όλοι γι' αυτό. Θα ήθελα να ρωτήσω από ποιο σημείο πιστεύετε ότι θα πρέπει να ξεκινήσει κάποιο ηλικιακά και αν υπάρχει κάποιο όριο στο οποίο πρέπει να φτάσει. Δηλαδή, αν εσεί μετά από κάποια ηλικία ή κάποια επίτευξη ενό στόχου θα σταματούσατε. I will talk uh, now as a member of the Information Technologies Institute where we are searching for uh, good uh, programmers and uh, people to, to work on uh, the development of new prototypes, not uh, really products, but uh, at, the, at the prototype stage. Uh, I believe that uh, programming is something you can uh, learn at uh, university, and uh, the more you, you deal with it, the better you, you get. So you should never uh, s stop uh, programming, but it's like a bicycle if you know how to program. If you leave it for one, two years, then you can uh, come back. Uh, just, I would like to make a statement I didn't make this uh, morning, uh, that uh, I have, uh, this is my personal opinion, that uh, MATLAB and uh, programs like MATLAB have uh, killed uh, especially Greek engineers. And uh, this is what I see every day at uh, ITI, so I would uh, recommend to all of you to use MATLAB for uh, doing something uh, fast and uh, fast prototyping, I don't know, and to, to do the, some uh, exams at uh, the university. But if you want to work uh, in, a competitive in a competitive environment, you have to learn to program in C, C++, Java, whatever, even Visual Basic, but not MATLAB. Sorry for this. So, 
Another question there? Another question there, there. So, because we have some uh, connection uh, appointment with uh, Athens through Skype, I think we get only these two questions, and then we can discuss perhaps outside. Hello to everyone. First of all, thank you for your helpful insights. I would like to address a question to Mr. Miliopoulos mainly. And I, I would like to ask you, uh, what do you think of the recent uh, developments in the air energy field in Africa? I have been reading uh, more and more lately about huge investments in uh, enormous uh, photovoltaic parks. And uh, I'd like to ask you if you think that this is the, the breakthrough, the first step towards alleviating poverty in Africa. Uh, are you referring to the projects for uh, energy and electrification in Africa? Yeah. Uh, I guess uh, this is a, uh, an initiative to bring, uh, as you know, if, if you look at the specifics of the, um, the statistics, uh, uh, Africa is the less electrified uh, uh, continent, and uh, there is uh, an effort uh, 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 initiated by uh, the White House uh, mainly, and then there are a lot of players that... Uh, uh, are involved, and as a matter of fact, uh, at Georgia Tech we have uh, uh, an NSF center, and the NSF center has been uh, this uh, organization, Ask Georgia Tech, and the, uh, the NSF center to uh, participate in that. Uh, that's a very novel, uh, uh, novel uh, purpose, and uh, uh, relates basically to developing um, energy resources, electric energy resources that can be deployed in areas where there is no infrastructure. Okay. Obviously, we have a lot of work to do, and, uh, uh, and the smart grid and microgrid kind of uh, approaches uh, is very um, fundamental to this approaches. I think this is uh, something that everybody should, uh, uh, um, should subscribe to the goals of this uh, uh, project. Uh, on the other hand, this is just a start, uh, a very small start, and only scratches the surface of the problem uh, in Africa. I'm not sure if I answer, answer your question or uh, uh, not, but it's, uh, uh, and of course, this, uh, the developments in this area will benefit uh, the entire world because these technologies can be integrated with the uh, traditional infrastructures to reach uh, remote areas and so on. Um, Thank you, you have covered my question. And the last question there. Hello, uh, my name is Olga Vruzgu. I'm from Aristotle University. Uh, basically what I want to ask is that uh, we live in a world where everything moves really quickly, technology moves really quickly, and trends go up and down, and by the time somebody starts specializing in an area, or a topic, it might be hot, and by the time we finish, it's not. So what I want to ask basically is if by your experience you know a way to overcome this, um, or if it's just a matter of flexibility or having a good eye at things. I may, may I answer, but uh, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so to predict the, uh, what you are asking is, uh, uh, I would say that uh, uh, you should uh, stay, definitely you should uh, focus on the basics, like programming, like uh, basics of electrical engineering, and this will be applicable to any type of uh, trend uh, within the future. That's my answer. Uh, well, that's a very good perspective, and uh, I... Uh, uh, what you said is that by the time you work on this, uh, it's not so hot topic, uh, initially it's hot topic and so on. What we see mostly happening is that uh, people start working on something and then finally they found out that somebody else has done it already. So it's more common to get into this situation than, uh, uh, than to start working in an area and uh, uh, fade away. Um, and I will take, I will, uh, uh, I will reinforce the, uh, the fact that 
uh, we, if you start working on something, invent something new and, fa and, uh, uh, and shape the future. Uh, most of the, of the times uh, that the uh, discoveries are uh, uh, occurring is when somebody works on something, likes it so much that he develops a better way to do things, a better mouse, and uh, that, uh, that is a, uh, what we call a discovery. Uh, so that shapes the, the future. Uh, so this means that uh, today we have uh, uh, the communications, the internet allows you to research the topic very thoroughly to see what everybody has done and uh, 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 then take it one step, uh, one step farther. So, uh, this concludes, ah, and there is an end. Ah, thank, thank you. you, okay. Ah, I so, do have a comment. Since me and the girl over there are the only girls to ask a question, uh, do the grades apply to us or sure, no? Sure, sure. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, uh, in this point, I would like to thank the keynote speakers and the invited speakers. And 